And I think there's a big difference between acknowledging what happened, like you can acknowledge the fact of it. Right. There's a huge difference between acknowledging and accepting. That's right. So accepting is going to come much later in our, in our mile marker. Yeah. So we acknowledge that this loss, this shock, the numbness, maybe even the denial, we acknowledge the event, but we're sort of in denial, like I can't, I can't believe this is happening. I, I can't. I can't feel all this emotion. And so that's and if you sort could, of that. by the way, it would be overwhelming. Mm. If it could, you know, Paul talked about it. For sure, you're going to the third heaven. It's like there's a sense of going, I just soon peace out and get out of here, but God wants me to stay here. There's a sense that. if I could be, you know, we, in human, human growth and development, anybody knows this, that studied even a Psych 101 course in college, is Piaget and uh, Erickson and others who did this in Kohlberg. There are these stages of growth and development that every human on any continent goes through. And so the stages of grief that these mirror so much, like from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and others have done work, they mirror this because if I could be fully immersed, and I'm not talking about baptism, doctor, but if fully immersed in this, it would be overwhelming and I don't know that I could sustain living. Mm. So there is these stages that are really We've named what God invented in these stages of trauma, stages of grief. But if I could fully get it that, on that day, I think it would be, I would be overwhelmed. Yeah. In other words, we experience the fact of what happened, but it's actually part of God's mercy that the impact yes. leaks into our life over time yeah. because if the full impact of trauma would have hit us all at once, it may have killed us yeah, or true. overwhelmed us to the point where we couldn't be resilient and come back Let's from it. Let's connect this to the reality of Jesus on the cross. Mm. Why is it that what happens to Christ on the cross is so epic of epic proportions that had the um, ability to, to, to wipe out sin and death as strongholds over our life? Because Jesus does on the cross what you and I in our human limitations could never have done. Yeah. He experienced the overwhelming full impact of the trauma of sin mm. on the sign uh, of, of pure evil, which is the cross, and he overcame it so that we have the kindness of God. We have the mercy of God that that thing can be kind of by his grace, you know, um, taken over time. That's so good, Joel. So that's that first stage. It's the loss, the hurt, the shock, the numbness, the denial. Okay, now, typically what's gonna happen next is some anger. It's not, I can't <laughs> believe this is happening, but I'm so angry that this is happening. And I didn't want this, I didn't ask for this. Many times I didn't cause this, and yet it is coming at me, it's happening to me. And that anger can either be turned outward or be turned inward. Mm -hmm. And so, Jim, talk a little bit about that. What is anger turned outward and what is anger turned inward? Well, anger turned outward can be, it can look like a lot of things. It can be blaming, and blame is usually an attempt to discharge pain when you blame people. It can be sense of just saying, and we see David maybe a little bit in the imprecatory Psalms or others saying, you know, God, what are you doing here? Uh -huh. God, you know, there were other people you could have taken out of my life or you know, or a famous uh, author and friend of mine wrote a book called It's Not Supposed to Be This Way. <laughs> Even to God to go, this is not how it should have been. I could almost hear God saying, you're right. Yeah, we're not in Eden anymore. Mm -hmm. So that anger turned outward at my, and, and, and it could be at one level against the person who's harmed me, the system, God, whoever, whatever you want to call it. Anger turned inward is in the stages of grief, what we typically call depression. It's literally pressing down the anger like on my soul and I'm stuffing it and Beach balls in my office. I have a little beach ball, and I have a hand grenade in my office. It's a gutted one, but I do. <laughs> it's an important detail, it's, it's, Jim. it's very important <laughs> to announce that. But if you hold a beach ball underwater long enough, it'll come like a, a grenade, mm -hmm. and suddenly that anger turned inward. You can't afford it, and what it does, and we know scientifically and medically what it does to my soul and then to my body because the body mm. keeps the score. So I'm stuck in a stage of grief and healing. I'm just stuck there. And the longer that depression goes on there, anger turned inward, mm. the neural pathways of the brain can say, well, this is my new norm and a literal rut go on in your brain that's gonna take a lot of antidepressants to get that brain functioning again. Very mm. dangerous. Hmm. And I think you've also said many times, what we don't work out, we act, act out. out. Right. And so we're talking about not just moving through, but working through these stages. It's an active program, it's not just coasting. Mm -hmm. yeah. But mm -hmm. I think we've gotta understand that anger is 
I know the Bible makes it very clear, it's not the feeling of anger that is the sin. It is what we do as a result, as a of, result of that anger. Yeah, be angry and do not sin. Yes. So this is part of it. Yeah. And I don't think that we need to beat ourselves up. Like, why am I feeling angry? Because for me, I'm a pretty peaceful person. And I can really, when I get angry, I really beat myself up. Yeah. And then, of course, I call Jim, set up an appointment, and I'll say, is this normal? Like, I just, I feel like this is so not normal, you know? And, um, and Jim, you've been so gracious at times to explain, you're right. What you are walking through is not the normal that it you thought. Is, it is an injustice. And it God is. himself would speak to it. This is, this is an injustice. And it's not wrong to feel angry right. that this has happened or this has been taken or this has been done to you or, or even that God allowed this. You know, there's, there's just the reality is it's an injustice. So, of course, there's going to be some anger around it. So then right off of that, we can find some fear. Mm -hmm. We can find panic. And then this one's really interesting, Jim, shopping for pain or searching for safety. Mm -hmm. And you explained to me one time that our brain is wired for safety. For confidence and knowing. It's going to want to say, and this is next, yes, wired for safety, but the brain, like Wheel of Fortune, is going out automatically and autonomically to fill in the gaps. And I bet this may happen next, or this may not. The brain's always searching for what's going to happen next. And I think that's so fascinating because what happens in my brain is sometimes when I'm searching for what happens next, I run ahead and I write a script of what mm -hmm. a good God should surely do. Yeah. Then I wanna hold God accountable to outcomes of my own making. And that can lead right into the disorientation that's yeah. also part of this stage. And here. that's by the way where I say it, all not to be cute seriously, but G-O-D in this on-demand society. The dog on internet's slow. Or the lady at some restaurant slow, but she's a lot faster than you, God. G-O-D does not stand for God on demand. Wow. And that's that theological, if not, may I say, sometimes idolatrous thing of, you need to, enough of this, God. You need to come now, and if you don't, and I've written the script, so make sure the script gets enacted by you, God, for you won't say this. But for if I were running the universe, mm -hmm. if I were God, so G-O-D is not God on demand, and I have to say, how do I go and have, and not to sidebar it too much, but you know, and that is to feel Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, forsaken why have you forsaken me? And then Lord, if there's any, any way, three times, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. But there's a sense that I get to say, God, would you take me out of this pain? Would you let this cup pass for me? Is there a way? And then that surrender that says, God, not my will, but yours be done. There's a humility and a surrender, but guess what? I get to say, could you take the cup away? Mm. I mean, theologically, I don't think I've made any errors here. Yeah, I, I call it uh, the genie in a bottle theology, <laughs> right? We got three, three, and it's almost like this is how I rationalize it in my mind. I've got three wishes and I'm not wasting it on, on the frivolous <laughs> stuff. Like, but this is one of my major wishes in God. Like, aren't you my genie in a bottle? Like I'm plead, I've lived a good life. Like I've been pretty moral. Yeah. Why, why can't you just pull through on this one? And so what I think Jim, you just described so eloquently is a shift that has to take place in our perspective of God as a genie in a bottle versus God who sits as king over the universe. And, and God's kindness to us is that we're his children. So he invites us just like any good children will, you know, he invites us to plead and to ask, right? But there is this assurance, this comfort of knowing that because God is kind, what he gives is a blessing, but what he doesn't give is actually a form of protection, which yes. I know is what you've taught often, Lisa. Yeah, and that's hard. That's hard. It is hard, but I think as we walk with God, we learn to trust him. And one thing that I do is I like to go back when I can't see what God is working out now and into the future, I like to go back and trace his hand of faithfulness in previous situations where God has walked me through something. Yeah. And when I do that, I can stand on the faith and search for the confidence of yeah. knowing that God is good. God is good to me and God is good at being God. And he got me from back here to now and he's surely gonna get me from now to there. Think of the confidence. We have Philippians 1, 6, don't we? 
But I am confident of this. There's your confidence to tell your brain right out of the word of God. I am confident of this. Don't understand it, but he who began a good work in me, he will continue it in me and through me and perfect it in me until I'm in heaven. Now, there's two other things that I can find myself getting stuck here. Because remember, I said I'm bringing the issues. So um, here are some issues. We skipped right over. I mentioned it, but right in the middle of the fear and the panic, there are these two things, the shopping for pain or searching for safety. We yeah. talked about the searching for safety mm -hmm. and then the, the disorientation. Mm -hmm. So in the disorientation, I find myself saying, yeah, but what about this? Yeah. But what about this? Mm -hmm. But what about this? But what about this? And I, I am trying right now to tell myself that God isn't asking me to carry every day forward from here. He's yeah. only asking for me to carry today and he will help me carry it. Mm -hmm. And so when I start running ahead and saying, yeah, but what about this and this and this and this, I feel like I'm trying to prepare myself. Like if I can run ahead and see all the possibilities that I'm not gonna be so caught off guard and maybe there's some wisdom to that, but the danger of that is trying to carry everything into the future rather than just letting God walk with me today. And God has given me grace for today, hope for tomorrow, but grace for today. So the what about, what about, what about, that kind of disorientation and carrying too much is, is a struggle that I have. Well, that can be, you know, with the shopping for pain, I may be going out and say, I'll bet there's more. Let me look and what are they doing? People do it on social media. Is there someone there? Are they talking about me or something like that? And it's for me to try to, who I am called to live by faith in, in today, sufficient unto every day, the word of God says, or the troubles thereof today. And I'm literally getting maybe ahead of God. I've done it to try to write the script and I'll bet this will be there. And I'm literally busy writing this script. What's a problem for me when I do that? It takes me out of the eternal now, the here, the right now, and being present with God. I've already left the moment, and I'm dissociated out in what we call preoccupation. I'm preoccupying a future moment that may never have. Hmm. And that's time of my life I've wasted, redeeming the time going forward for the days or evil, that I've left the moment. That's the only moment I have to live is now. Mm -hmm. So the whatabouts moving forward, yeah. that can sometimes get me stuck. Sure. And when we say shopping for pain, here's how it plays out in my life. I, I want to go figure out why this happened. Mm. And so shopping for pain is almost like looking, looking, looking for more and more and more. Maybe it's that we're looking at somebody's social media. Like maybe it's a friend that no longer is our friend. And then all of a sudden we want to try to figure this out. Like what happened and what were they really looking for? Or what, what did these other people have that I didn't have? Whatever it is. So we go to their social media and we start digging and reading and all of that. And I, I have learned it really is not helpful. And what would you hope to, I know we're on therapy and theology, not in just therapy in an office. What would you hope to get out of that? If I can go out and mm -hmm. fill in the gap and shopping for pain, or we've said sometimes we'll call it searching for safety. I'm trying to find it all out. I want to find out why, but then I ask a deeper question. Well, why would you do that? And I'm curious, not furious. So I say, huh, why would you, what would you hope to get out of going to try to look at around and scan everything? Your payoff might be what? Maybe. I wrongly think that having the answers will ease the ache of my There's sorrow. Your, payoff. Attempt, your, your desired payoff. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when I look at Mark 14, which you so eloquently um, quoted in Mark 14, starting in verse 32, we get to see Jesus, he's finished the last supper and he is about to go to the cross, but he's in this garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And what I realized is because Jesus is full humanity and absolute divinity at the same time, that meant he was feeling the weight of that sorrow that was just overwhelming to him. But in his divinity, he had all the answers. And when he had all the answers, it did not ease the ache of his wow. sorrow. So me going shopping for pain, me trying to figure out why this happened, 
that's never gonna ease the ache of my sorrow. It really is just shopping for more pain. Yeah, it might compound it actually. Mm -hmm. I think too, um, Lisa, you said Mark 14, the other one is John 12. Um, and John, the disciple who's, he's referred to as the beloved, he refers to himself as the beloved disciple. He's Jesus' bestie going through and through. And so, you know, he kind of gives this intimate picture. I think it's really interesting that John emphasizes the humanity of Jesus. So one of the big questions theologically we're going to ask is, was Jesus ever in moments of trauma? Did yeah. he ever experience trauma? Here are a couple thoughts. Um, Jesus, it says in John 4, 7, he needs to go to uh, Samaria, to the well to get water. That the Greek word need there is not like, oh, it might be good. There's an urgency. Like Jesus is the homeboy is thirsty and he could have yeah. been passing out. So he needs to. He weeps for Lazarus in John chapter 11. Talk about uh, a trauma. He's zealous as, as a response at the temple. You alluded to that earlier, I think, you know, in John chapter two. He has distress over his disciples, John 14. He cares for his mother on the cross. John 19, as he's dying, he looks out, talk about traumatic event. And he has distress over Judas, who is a close friend in June 13, over the outcome of Judas's life. These are traumatic events. In John chapter 12, um, Jesus again is overwhelmed. And here's what I think is so interesting. Uh, Jesus asks a question and he says, what shall I say? And so I just want to point out, sometimes it could be like, well, questions are bad. And I, I, we've never actually got into a theological and therapeutic disagreement here. And so this well, might be the first the one. Not on the set. Not on the set. This might be the first one. Um, <laughs> but here's, I, I want to make a suggestion, Jim yeah. and Lisa, I'm curious what you guys think. I actually think the issue isn't about the question, but actually it's three things. It's the substance of the question. It's who we ask the questions to, and then what do we do with these questions Couldn't agree that we more. ask? Oh, I love that, buddy. And that's what Jesus does. He yeah. asks a question, but he considers what is going to be the substance of my question. Who, who am I going to ask the question to? Who better than the Father to ask this question? Yeah. And then what is he going to do as a result of the question? He maintains faithfulness in his ministry. And just uh, another thought, I think these questions give us three things. It gives us the opportunity to reset so we can gain stability in the midst of instability. It gives us an opportunity to redefine our current reality based on what is actually true, and it leads us to reassert what is actually truth in the midst of what is false. That's one of those paradigm shifts we were talking about mm -hmm. before off, off the set. Mm -hmm. I think there's a sense of you frame that up. I love that, by the way, but just that's, that's a paradigm shift in my thinking. You go, okay. And I always ask, and you know this enough from epithemia in Greek, the idea of lust or desire. Is this a demand that I have of God or is it a legitimate desire? It might look like it, you know, but it, am I coming saying, Father, I love this. It's not a demand. I desire this. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I like what you said about what, it's what we do with our questions. And I think when we get stuck in this stage and we start shopping for pain, when we are going back and asking the questions even metaphorically, maybe we're not even having a conversation with the one who hurt us, but we're trying to figure out something to answer the question, why did you hurt me? I think that's where we're asking the wrong person. It might be a right question, but we're asking the wrong person. And so instead of turning to the source of the pain, we need to turn to the source of life.